As soon as I landed in Denver, I powered up my cell. I had a series of texts from Dylan's phone. I'm not sure what time they were sent. 7.45 a.m. Come find me. Who is this? Where's Dylan? I'm with the police. We'll find you. There was no response. After I got my luggage, I rented a small truck and drove to the ranger station. The police officer I spoke with told me they were letting the ranger handle the investigation for now. As soon as I arrived, I was escorted to a back room. I assumed it was the same ranger that had talked to Dylan. He was a lanky, disheveled man with black hair and pale white skin. He reeked of smoke and looked like he hadn't slept in years. I sat down across from him. He placed his hat on the table, lit a cigarette, and spoke. We called you down here because, at first, we needed your phone as a part of the investigation. But I'm afraid that's no longer necessary. His raspy voice was tattered and broken. His clothes shared the same features. What happened? I'm sorry, but I can't discuss any details at the moment. You need to leave this to the professionals, okay? We will do everything we can to help your friend and find him. Are you kidding me? I'm sorry, but we can't have civilians interfering. We need you to stay safe and out of the way. I got text messages from his phone right after I landed. Something happened to him. I know this is hard. We're searching all possibilities, but we do not believe there is any foul play. Teenagers in the area have been known to play pranks on lone campers. You are more than welcome to help us with reports. I know how hard it is to lose a friend. Oh, and these teenagers slash tires steal phones and send violent threats too? Are you kidding me? You even told Dylan that he was in danger. I promise you, we're working night and day. I think the best thing that you can do is stay off the trails and be there for his family and- I couldn't even let him finish his sentence. I was too upset. I stormed out. He didn't even attempt to stop me. I know that was all BS. What was he trying to keep from me? I had text evidence that Dylan was being followed by someone or something. I'm going to figure this out. I went to the only place I was familiar with in the area, Dylan's apartment. I still remembered his door code from the last time that I had visited. The apartment was eerily quiet. I was overcome with the feelings of fear and sadness. As soon as I saw a picture of Dylan in the kitchen, I couldn't help it. I had to cry. After a few moments, I collected myself, opened the fridge, and pulled out a beer. I needed to sit back and think. As I got up to throw away the empty beer, I saw something. It was Dylan's map, his map of Colorado of all the places that he'd camp. I had forgotten about it. Dylan used this large topographical map to keep track of all the places he'd trekked. The map was riddled with black thumbtacks and a few white ones. Dylan's method was simple. Black thumbtacks for areas he'd already explored, white for his upcoming adventures. I wrote the coordinates of the white markers. I searched through Dylan's apartment and collected all his remaining camping gear. I grabbed a wooden baseball bat from his closet as well. I knew where to go. I loaded up the truck, tossing supplies in the truck bed, and headed to the mountain. It was a long drive. Eventually, I passed an old bridge on the way. I didn't notice any sign of recent construction. Ten minutes later, I pulled up next to Dylan's car. It was eerie to see the yellow police tape wrapping around the body of the car. It made the situation all too real. As soon as I parked the pickup, I dropped a pin on my phone. After what seemed like an eternity of hiking, I reached the point on the map where Dylan had marked, and I got to work setting up camp. I was running out of daylight. I constructed my tent and placed a sleeping bag inside of it. As soon as night fell, I lit a large fire and quickly snuck away from the camp. I took cover in trees about a hundred yards away. I posted up beneath a large tree, cracked open an energy drink, and kept my eyes glued on the tent. 11.13 PM, nothing. I thought I heard some footsteps rustling in the leaves, but I chalked it up to wildlife. 12.02 AM. It was quieter, still nothing. 1.10 AM. Oh! I yelled as I jumped. I almost had a heart attack. Three deer walked by me. I started to nod off and they woke me up. 2.23 AM. I was exhausted, cold. I'm trying to stay awake. I drank my last bit of caffeine. 3.11 AM. I saw something. Walking towards the tent, it was a man. With a flashlight, he stared in, looking around my tent. What the? 
3.13 a.m. He noticed no one was in the tent and started shining the flashlight around the woods. He didn't see me. 3.19 a.m. He started leaving and heading south. I followed him. I took off my boots so I could walk quietly. I threw a couple more pairs of wool socks on and kept my distance. 4.01 a.m. I continued to follow, taking countless turns in the dark. He seemed to be wondering, shining the flashlight in front of him as he walked. 4.17 a.m. He finally stopped near a pile of leaves. He tripped on something and started brushing the leaves away. And I saw his face. It was the park ranger. There were doors under the pile, huge metal cellar doors. A chain was fastened around the handle and the doors led straight into the ground. He stopped to smoke a cigarette, pulled a notepad from his coat pocket and scribbled something down. After he finished writing, he started looking through a flip phone. There's no way. He sent a text. 4.19 a.m. Where is Dylan? 4.20 a.m. This guy had Dylan's phone. It chimed right after I sent the text. He read it and he whispered to himself, I told you to leave this to the professionals and put the phone back in his pocket. I wanted to kill him. I was blinded by rage. He started undoing the chains and making a lot of noise. I couldn't let him disappear from my sight. I was running out of time. 4.28 a.m. I did it. I did it. I hit that guy in the skull with a bat. Right before he opened the doors, I swung as hard as I could. He fell to the ground and didn't move. The chain rested next to his bleeding temple. He never heard me coming. I'll never forget the sound the bat made when it connected. The dull thud and the crack of the solid wood smashing into bone. Sweat and blood misted the air as he fell. We opened the cellar doors. <laughs> I wished I hadn't. It was the smell putrid stench of rotting flesh that hit me first. As soon as I saw the first limb sticking out of the massive mound of corpses, I had to look away. My head was spinning. My stomach turned over. I ran. I was mortified by what I had just seen. 6.48 a.m. I got back to Dylan's apartment. I was still sweating and breathing heavily as I bought a plane ticket for the next flight home. I decided the best plan was to call the police when I'd landed. I just wanted to go home. My heart was pounding. 8.58 a.m. Red and blue lights flashed outside as a police car pulled up to Dylan's door. I tried to keep my cool. I spoke with the officer. I felt like I was going to vomit. As we were talking about Dylan's disappearance, the officer's radio receiver sounded. I listened in horror. Some campers discovered a scarecrow, strung high in a tree, with the noose around its neck. The campers claim there is a dark liquid seeping from its burlap skin and is wearing the park ranger's hat. My thoughts began to race. I've made a huge mistake. The ranger was just investigating a lead which led him to the cellar. He must have found Dylan's phone after I got the weird text. But, but how did he get a key to the cellar? I, I acted so quickly. I hit him with the bat and I ran. What have I done? I just left him there to die. And most importantly, the cellar. What? What was that? What was the cellar? My phone chimed. I had a text from an unknown number. 10.10 10 a.m. Why did you run?